<laughs> it is Tuesday, May 14th, 12 o'clock Pacific time. I'm Carrie Jorgensen, and I am a senior college coach here at <clears throat> ESM Prep. Thank you so much for watching our recording and dialing in to Decisions Are Back. What now? What now? I am Carly Nuzo, and I'm also a senior college coach here at ESM. Um, and we're, it's that time of year. It's um, your student or you, if you are are a go-getting student that's listening to this uh, webinar, you have the next step. Uh, we were just talking about the stepping, like how most of high school, this is, this is the goal. So you've made it, you have the sweatshirt, you, well, unless you're on a wait list, we'll, we'll <laughs> talk about that. But um, you have an idea of where you're going, if not knowing exactly where you're going. But um, you put so much time and effort and resources into getting to this next step. And so we want to make sure that you make the most of it. So that's what this webinar is about today. Absolutely. Thanks so much for tuning in again. And yeah, post decisions. Um, that's kind of what our what our goal is for today in terms of covering topics. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to move to the next slide. Carly, do you click over arrows? Oh, enter maybe. Nope. Um, do you have to exit full screen? Maybe. Sorry, guys. Hold on here. Slideshow. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we figured we would actually start by just sort of talking through some case studies in terms of um, who we've worked with in our own practices and who would really benefit from thinking about a thoughtful transition to college and or a thoughtful transition from one college to the next. Um, so Carly, are there any students that you can think of from your caseload who you, you feel would benefit from um, kind of hearing this chat? Yeah. So, you know, I think that we both have, we both work with high school students and then we both work with college students too. Um, and so the big thing that we've noticed is that a lot of our kids, especially the high school students that we work with, because the goal at ESM is that we surround you with support. We surround you with mentorship from um, test prep to academic, to counseling, all the things, even like executive functioning. And then you use all that support to get to your, to reach your goals. And then we send you off and it's a bit of a rough transition sometimes. Um, and so that's where the idea of these next services came from is we want to help you be successful toward those longer term goals beyond just checking the box. Yes, you accept your acceptance. <laughs> um, and so this could be a lot of different kids. So from one end of the spectrum, it's a kid that knows they want to go to competitive grad school. Um, and so this is very like similar, it mirrors the process with high school. So we always say that the earlier you start with us, the better, the, like the more bang for your buck you get out of our support. So we can start with a game plan that is set up for you to be successful at the end of your four years. It's the same thing with college. Um, so going through your academic planning, your extracurriculars, all of that to get to those goals. Um, we also have kids that are maybe they hit the jackpot and that Hail Mary, ex the application that they sent in, they got into that incredibly competitive school, which is so exciting. Um, but they might want to make sure that they have the tools and support to make that transition to be successful at that school. Um, or vice versa, maybe your student um, didn't get into the dream school and wants to make the most out of um, out of their experience that they're going to now. So that's where I, I really bond with this experience. I went to the University of Alabama for undergrad and I tell this story often um, that I was, I took advantage of being it sounds funny to say it this way, but I took advantage of being a big fish in a small pool. 
which at a giant university like the University of Alabama sounds really silly, but I did everything. I went after every opportunity. I talked to my professors. I took grad classes. I did research. I did everything. And from there, I got into Harvard. And so um, being able to set that game plan, set your next goal, because you've been so focused on that first goal um, of getting into college, focusing in on that bigger goal of what's next and making sure that you're set up to, to reach that goal. Um, sorry, I really went off topic, topic of just the one case study you asked me to give. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, you turn it back to you now. <laughs> you set it up perfectly. I think um, a lot of times kids get to this point in their high school career, you know, May of your senior year, and you can look back and you can feel like you worked really, really hard and all of your marks are in, your GPA, your test scores, your extracurricular activities. And you can look at this next chapter as really a blank slate. Um, and so we as mentors working for a mentorship company really strongly believe that having a thoughtful game plan to make the most of this next blank slate is so critical. You know, us adults on the other side of this, you know, post-grad understand that what you do during your four or sometimes five years of college is absolutely critical in terms of setting yourself up for financial and overall success um, beyond college. And so, you know, the mentorship piece can't be underscored enough. I think all students could benefit from it. Um, but specifically, like, like Carly said, that student that might have stretched a little bit and somehow gotten into that incredibly highly selective institution, um, they may find that once they get to school, it's a bit overwhelming. And they're in a classroom full of a bunch of students who also went to top high schools around the country. And that competition and that that feeling of like, oh my goodness, I'm not the top of my class can really be jarring for students. So, you know, working with a mentor to try and um, navigate that feeling alone, I think is, is really pretty crucial uh, to adjusting to, to college. The other type of student that could really benefit from this is maybe it's somebody who um, went to a really small private high school, for instance. And then I remember I had a friend in college that was this way. We we grew up in the same hometown. I went to a large public high school. She went to the small private high school. And we ended up at the same college, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, relatively large institution. You, I had to really work to register for my classes, be my own advocate, check the the book, make sure I was, you know, taking everything in my major, getting all of the units. And for me, coming from a big high school, that really wasn't a huge transition for me. I was able to do it because I was used to being my own advocate throughout high school. On the flip side, my friend who had gone to the smaller private school really had a kind of culture shock that first year of college where it was difficult. It was, it was a lot for her to take in. The freedom was like intoxicating and wonderful. But with that came you know, learning how to really navigate things on your own. Um, and so we want to be there for our students and help them really adjust in a healthy way to college um, and avoid really a crash and burn situation where they finally have the freedom, they've spread their wings, and then we want to see as much success as possible um, through that adjustment. Um, I think another student, you know, if you're we all know, especially Carly and I, how competitive the landscape is out there. Um, to get into some of these, you know, more prestigious name brand schools. And maybe your student didn't get into the school that they really wanted to initially. Um, in fact, I worked with a transfer student this, this past cycle who landed at UT Austin, incredible school. She just, her number one school was University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. She had her, her sight set on that since high school and she didn't get in initially. Um, and so she went to UT Austin. She worked really hard that first semester, got a great GPA networked with her professors, joined a bunch of organizations, and then she was able to successfully transfer to the University of Michigan for her sophomore year. So there's so many reasons why starting your college career off on a strong note really matters. Um, for us as, you know, mentors and counselors, and for you as parents, it's, um, we want, we want to really set up our students for as much success as possible. Yeah. And, you know, so, um, Carrie brought up, uh, transfer counseling, um, we've talked about undergraduate mentorship um, and then same thing with grad school. So um, a lot of our students already 
want to go into careers that either require grad school or would highly benefit from grad school or just know that they want to go to grad school. Um, and same thing. So your, your grades in college, again, matter. Your networking matters. All of those things from the get-go. Um, your course selection, all of that feeds back into that same, it's a fresh start. You're starting over in college, but you're going through a lot of similar steps in a very different environment. And so having, having help to be very successful in that next step is, is invaluable. Absolutely. All right. Let's see if my slides work. All right. Hey. <laughs> Um, okay, so I wanted to share this um, with all of you. Um, it was a survey, a nationwide survey done by um, Inside Higher Ed, um, which I just think shows, shows the importance of this. So in practice and anecdotally, Carrie and I both know that there's a huge need for this service, these services. Um, but I think that these stats really show that and go back to Carrie's point too about especially at those larger universities, but even in some cases at smaller uh, colleges, there just isn't the same support. Um, there isn't the same support for students to help navigate it. So um, just slightly less than half of students said that they didn't even get guidance on the required courses and course sequencing for graduation. So 45% of students said that they were not given adequate adequate quite oh my gosh adequate <laughs> guidance on that um same with degree progress to make sure you graduate on time that's huge um guidance related to choosing a major is 33 percent we have a lot of students that talk about potentially changing majors that drops down to 28 percent um advice on how to prepare for career goals guidance related to internships and research opportunities Again, all the way down to only a quarter of students were um, giving advice on that. Um, balancing study and extracurricular activities. Again, that's something that's very like relationship mentorship based, I think. And so that's not something that I would expect from a college guidance counselor, um, but it is something that we would provide in undergraduate mentorship. In fact, all of these things are. So keeping up with registration deadlines, beginning to manage different courses, um, how college uh, co college classes work, um, balancing a course load, selecting a balanced course load, um, and um, everything else along the way. But um, yeah. yeah. I'll just chime in here. Um, I just had the privilege of listening to Jennifer Wallace. Um, she's the author of the book, Never Enough. Highly recommend you as parents, especially, um, read this really compelling book. And she quoted, um, a professor who had done a lot of research around kind of like, what are the, what are the things that you can help your students focus on in college to find success as adults? And it was really three things, finding a professor that knows you more than just a student. So knows you for who you are. Um, I think the colleges that change lives, colleges do a phenomenal job of this. There are stories in that book, of professors that invite students over to their house for dinner. Um, how cool is that? So making a professor connection that is genuine and meaningful, I think Carly alluded to that. She found those professor connections when she was in college and that led her to Harvard. Um, having The second thing is having the opportunity to apply your learning through summer jobs. So in the same vein that we want our high school students to get a little bit of job experience, go get that job at the coffee shop, go get the job at the ice cream store. Same thing in college, we want you to be able to actually apply what you're learning in the classroom to then the real world and then take that real world experience and apply it back into the college classroom. Um, and, and that just enriches your whole experience as a student and um, enriches the your classmates as well. And then the third thing is really being part of an extracurricular activity that gives you grounding and gives you the opportunity to contribute to your school community. Because um, much of what colleges look for when they're first assessing high school students is what type of what type of community contributor was this student? How did they impact those around them? How did they, if they came from a privileged background, how did they use their privilege in a meaningful way? And I think employers are really looking for that same thing. Um, what did you do during your four or five years that helped kind of move the needle in terms of social causes or 
meeting a need that um, has not been met yet on your campus. How will you be a team player? How will you be a problem solver? All of that is showcased more. It's like, don't just tell me, show me. So um, that's a big part of any initial resume, which is also something that we'll help with. <laughs> yep. Um, so yeah, so the basis of all of these services um, would be if you have a rising freshman in college, so a uh, current high school senior, it would be a four-year game plan. Um, it, it would be largely, I think that the the biggest pieces here for your students would be support through that transition to college, which we've talked about quite a bit already, and also this four-year plan. So really thinking about, like I said, we've been so focused on this goal of getting into X college or getting into college in general that we need to now reorient to what the, what the big picture goal is now. Um, and so, and a lot of times that's not the case, you know, kids get to college and they, this is their goal, which is great. They should have fun, but it's also really grounding, um, and really beneficial for their futures to have a very specific next goal to work toward. Yeah. Um, and, and I, along with that, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, and along with that would be course selection, deciding if you want to stay in your major, what it would look like to transition out of your major, what your summer plans are as far as internships and jobs, what your extracurriculars are, and really building up that four-year plan so that you do end up where you want to be at, at the end of college. Absolutely. Leveraging that great network that you have that you get the privilege of connecting with because you get to wear the name of that college on your sweatshirt um, to the best of your ability and yeah. and kind of making the most of your four years like that is I, I can't be underscored enough um and the relationships you build in college really have an impacting um kind of framework for the rest of your life it's your network it's your alumni network and it's really um Eventually, who knows, you'll be knocking on someone's LinkedIn saying, hey, we both went here. Let's let's connect. And that could lead to a, a job or, or whatever. And as as graduated people, <laughs> we can attest that that's a thing. You feel this connection um, with uh, your fellow alum. So um, it's really important. It's always something I think about as living in Southern California. I meet so many people that went to like USC. I'm like, oh my gosh, please tell me you took advantage of the networking. And if you don't, it's such a loss. And it's almost like, it's like, it's a waste of going to a school that has such great networking. Um, and so really being, having someone there to help you figure out how to make the most of it is really important. So that's a good transition into undergrad mentorship. So um, I've been leading our undergrad mentorship division. Um, and it's really, we've been talking about different case studies of students that could benefit from this. It's very individualized. So for all kids, we'll be focused on setting the goals for your four-year plan. Um, but it's very based, it's based on what your goal is. So is your goal grad school? Is your goal, um, a solid job after graduation? Is your goal transfer? Um, you know, whatever it is, that's what we'll um, build toward. Um, so obviously, again, with those statistics, graduation on time, regular check-ins and accountability is huge, especially now that they're out of your house, um, to have someone that now you get to call and hear about the fun things and not, you know, um, nag them for <laughs> what they're doing. Um, you'd have, you would know that they are being held accountable. They have support that they need. Um, and are making the most of that experience um, through, like I said, obviously course selection, obviously um, resume building, any, any um, depending on their track, support to achieve whatever those goals are uh, post-grad. So just setting them up for success in the next step. Um, and so this could be a long-term or short-term relationship. Obviously at ESM, we love the long-term relationships. But even if it's just support through the transition to college, 
um, whatever sets your student up for success um, is great. Definitely. The mentorship, I kind of think of as like a bridge almost, you know, mm -hmm. once once your student's in college, you're cut off. You don't get to see, did they turn in their homework? You don't have access to the professor's grade book. And so as a mentor, you can sort of play that in between where you're trying to empower students to really become the adults that they are and build those soft skills that are needed to be successful. And then as a parent, you get to kind of sit back and know, all right, the nagging is not in my court. Carly's got it. Um, and it's just a really nice, I think, bridge and, and um, way for students to transition from the very highly handheld world of high school compared to the freedom of college. And so some, uh, some students may be in a case where they feel like, you know, they landed at a school, they're excited about uh, going to college, um, but they know that ultimately this is just stop A. And ideally they want to get to Z. Um, and so if you, if your student is in this situation, sometimes it comes up right after, you know, first semester when students really take a moment to reflect and realize, you know what, this isn't, this isn't quite the right fit. There's a number of reasons why students choose to transfer schools. It could honestly be anything from feeling homesick, um, possibly a negative experience or feeling like they wanna change their major and maybe the institution that they're at right now just isn't quite the right fit. Um, maybe it's geography. As a 16, rebellious 16, 17 year old, they thought they wanted to be on the other side of the country. And now they're realizing, you know what? I really am more of a West Coast kid. I wanna end up you know, closer to home or whatever that situation is. There's a million reasons why students transfer. Um, and what's key to transferring though is a lot like the um, first time students apply to college is you have to do your research. You have to know what are my chances at XYZ institution and how can I build a balanced college list? The good news is with transfer applicants, we are not applying to you know, 12, 15, 18 schools. It's usually a really, students are more focused. They know exactly what they want. Maybe they weren't able to verbalize that as 16, 17 year olds, but as an 18 or a 19 year old, you know. And so the list becomes very targeted. I think the most number of applicants I've had a student apply to in the transfer round is like six. And we really try to match the student um, with, with their wish list to the colleges in the most effective way. Because if the first stop didn't work, we want that second stop to be the stop. So then once students get there, they can really thrive. I can turn them over to Carly and get that uh, undergraduate mentorship. But the kind of crazy thing about transfer counseling is that the rates are really pretty interesting to look at. So I've pulled um, a couple of slides for you guys just to see kind of the difference in transfer admission rates. So first up is Harvard. It is more difficult to get into Harvard as a transfer student than as a freshman. Um, I think the reason that I can explain that that exists is because Harvard gets the pick of the litter. They curate the best possible class and not a lot of students leave. Um, they have a very high retention rate. I think it's something like 98%. So there's just not a lot of room to fill in those gaps. Yeah. Um, and they, they're they really highly focused on that fit. And, and um, you know, I think all of us would agree it would be pretty crazy. To, you know, you, you work so hard to get into Harvard be pretty crazy to actually leave. Um, so same with, you know, MIT, Stanford, um, Swarthmore, Yale, all the way until you start to see the pendulum swing a little bit. There's a little bit more va variability. Um, like if you can see, you know, Caltech has a 3% acceptance rate coming right out of high school, but 6% for transfer. Um, you know, Johns Hopkins is right about the same, um, so it, it's there. There's a lot of your top public universities are still going to have solid transfer rates because of because of laws in the state and stuff like that. Exactly. So this next slide will show more of kind of of what Carly is alluding to. So like a UCLA or UC Berkeley, they have what's called um, you know transfer agreement guarantees. Um, Berkeley and LA don't do the tag, but the other UCs do. But they have really strong pipelines of community college students who are told, essentially, if you take XYZ class, you declare this major, there's a very strong chance you're going to get in and earn, you know, probably like three, eight or higher GPA. Yeah. But you don't have that same level of assurance 
when you're applying as right out of high school, you know, 24% acceptance to Berkeley versus 11% as a senior in high school. Like those are, those are pretty, that's a pretty big swing. So the transfer process really involves going through the numbers and seeing, okay, where is there a statistical advantage? Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, fantastic school. You know, they're taking one in five students roughly rather than one in 10 students. Um, and so, you know, paying attention to the numbers is is really um, a critical part of our role when we do transfer counseling and making sure that students um, just just come up with a thoughtful college list that's going to benefit them so they only have to go through this process once. Um, and, you know, what makes a good transfer application is a lot of what is provided through our undergraduate mentorship, taking the right classes, um, building a really thoughtful resume, being reflective. Um, a lot of these colleges are going to ask similar questions that they asked when you applied as a senior, but also one more really important question, which is why do you want to transfer? And so having the self-awareness to be able to communicate what is it in your own personal growth and journey that's making you want to make this change for yourself is really critical. And that's where we come in to help students kind of communicate that in an effective way. Um, and then you do need letters of rec too. So those professors from college. Too. Yeah. Yeah. I think a big case study that we left out, which speaks to transfer a bit is say your student and which is another reason we didn't bring up like maybe your student didn't end up at the spot that they wanted to maybe something happened in high school um that impacted their application in a way that they just could not make up by the time they were applying to college um and so it there was this you know spot on their application that just colleges a lot of colleges couldn't overlook um this is their chance to try again. So we've talked about, you know, grad school, you get a blank slate, blank slate. Um, but for transfer, the same thing's true. And that would also be a good narrative into why you want to transfer. Um, if you could show and prove that you have grown and changed since then. Um, and Carrie would know better because she's, she's our transfer queen. Um, but um, there are different depending on when you're transferring in your coll collegiate career of when you would show your high school academic um, resume or not. Yep. Yep. Most students, if you're transferring private to private after your first year of college, you do need to, they, they lean on the high school transcript as mm -hmm. well. It just provides a greater narrative. The most emphasis is going to be on how did you do in, you know, college level economics, um, especially if you're telling us you want to be an economics major. So the classes you take and what you're doing that very first semester of college matter the most because you're if you think about it, you're applying in your second semester of college. So you really only have one one semester under your belt to show off. And so starting on that right foot and having that, you know, honest conversation, maybe the summer between high school and college around like, okay, is this your final destination? Do you feel really excited? If so, fantastic. Let's pour all our resources and energy into making the most out of the four years at this first stop. And if there's any inclination that it's not, then like, okay, let's game plan and set you up for successful transfer that second year. UCs are a different story in a lot of public institutions. They want to see um, about 60 units, 60 transferable units, which equates to two years of college. So you can't usually transfer until you're a junior um, for the public schools out there. Yeah, I think um, something that you you mentioned too with this um, that's really important too is, you know, Carrie was saying you only, you have less schools that you're applying for because of fit, but it's also now in most cases, your safety school is where you're already at. Right. And so your safety school is kind of like your target school too. It hopefully in a lot of cases is there's a lot of schools that you would rather just stay where you're at than apply there. Um, and so for transfer, you're just aiming higher um, in most cases. And so you, you don't need to spread your list as wide. Yeah, totally. And then beyond transfer applications, um, you know, for those students that are go-getters, already know they want to apply to grad school, um, Carly can tell you all about that. Yeah, I love grad uh, applications. Um, grad school is, in some ways, the process is similar, but it's very specific. 
Um, and so finding the right program for your interests and your career goals and really your strengths is so important because there's so much variation. And then within, once you find the type of program you're looking for, there's so much variation in the application requirements, um, acceptance rates between different programs, even at the same school or even at the same university, even within the same school at the same university. Um, it's just a huge difference. And so having someone um, that can help you walk through that, strategize based on the very specific programs and the acceptance rates and the requirements, and then how they'll set you up for success later after grad school, um, it's really important. And it's really hard even um, if your student was highly successful at the undergraduate application level, um, there's even more intricacies at the grad level. Um, the good news is though, is if a student starts with those programs in mind as an undergrad, um, the admission process is less daunting um, because it is specialized. So if your student is on the track and does the things that make them highly competitive for those more specific programs, then the admission process is less daunting than the undergraduate process. And we've seen so much success this year and it's so fun. Um, and so finding the right program, guidance and strategy around test prep, yes, it's back, and essays and narrative development. Um, then also resumes and um, course selection internships and things that make you um, competitive for those specific programs. So um, whether your student knows already that they're ready to go and they want to like, just like they started as, maybe they started as a high school freshman with us to prepare for college applications. If they're ready to get on that track now as freshmen in high school or in college, that's great. Um, or if you have older siblings that are planning to apply to grad uh, grad school this round, um, we we have support for you. So, and what this really all boils down to is, we want for our undergraduates to find success. Um, we get really attached to our kids, like really attached. You know, you spend a really intense, maybe two three years, getting to know students, their families hoping they can achieve their goals, get to that dream school. We know that that doesn't always happen given the insanity of the landscape, but at least a really quality fit school. And then once you're there, we want to see our kids be successful um, as mentors, as parents. And so, you know, I think we've covered pretty, pretty thoroughly what that looks like and what kind of services we offer. Um, yeah. so please feel free to reach out. If we left off tutoring, we have tutoring support too. I think that's the only tutoring. thing yes, to talk about. <laughs> yeah. well, college level tutoring. Our tutors are incredible. Um, like high school biology, they could do in their sleep. College biology, that's what they look like really love. So it's yeah. it's it's pretty impressive what our tutors can do. So please keep us in mind for that as well. So yeah, as Carrie said, we We've started this initiative because we love our students. We want to support them on, in the next level. Um, and if you have any questions um, for either of us, for both of us, um, let us know. And we'd be so happy to talk to you. All right. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye.